pastor and uh, serving with your word. We believe that you was guiding him in preparation and uh, you will lead him sharing your message to us. Let our hearts be open, let our minds be focused on mm-hmm. that what you have prepared for mm-hmm. us. May your name be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Well, it's a great uh, privilege to be here and uh, serve from the world and serve to you, and um, I'm uh, honored by God that I can do this. Um, As you know, uh, we are in the season of Lent, so even uh, the the texts that we we have uh, for the messages are, so to speak, more emphasizing this Lent season uh, than they're just like a series. Usually we would take a book from a Bible and then we would go through it and so on. Or sometimes we would just say, random, whatever God lays on our hearts. But uh, we are in the season of Lent, and um, uh, it's coming, uh, 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 John chapter 4, and Jesus and the woman. And actually, uh, without even uh, realizing it, it, it became a kind of right, right time to preach on this, especially because, you know, March 8th, uh, here and in some countries it's very much uh, celebrated as a uh, Women's Day uh, but um, some uh, comments that were made uh, well actually completely I, I would say even against women themselves uh, but um, uh, let's not start with that let's start with the word of God and let's read from uh, chapter 4 of the Gospel of John And we'll read the text uh, when Jesus talks with the Samaritan woman. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Joseph. Jo- Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tried, uh, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So the woman said, You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I will give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, 
I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. We will continue then with the rest of the text later. So, we have interesting facts here stated. And some of those uh, are given in the brackets, in the text, explaining certain things. And we don't have to go far, uh, you know, with the details, just to accept the fact that Jews, or Jews meaning those from Judea and Samaritan, from Samaria, didn't like one another. Uh, now, there is a long history, and we can talk a lot about it, so I don't want to take time with it. We'll just go as the text said to us. They didn't like each other. And for the sake of the text, it's enough for us. We can always go to the historical reasons and so on. I will only mention, because it's interesting, we will hear that because of what the woman is saying, she's quoting, obviously, from the text, which is called Pentateuch or Torah, or the Five Book of Moses. And she will recall things, whether from Genesis or Deuteronomy. And Jesus would also reply to her in that regard. But we also mentioned that something later, well, we will, when we come to that part, he says, you do not know who you worship. So, it says that the Pharisees were getting upset, and obviously uh, Jesus was uh, gaining uh, crowds around him. So, you know, when, when you see that somebody is gaining crowds, and the crowds are not getting to you, and you were a Pharisee, or you were in a person, uh, in a position of power, then you see, uh, realize, like, okay, we are losing authority and power here. So, but Jesus knew that it was still not his time to get in clash with the Pharisees, so he had to leave. Now, he's on the way to Galilee, so let's put it simplified. Galilee, Samaria, Judea. So Jesus is in Judea. He came from Galilee. Remember chapter 2, the wedding Cana of Galilee. So he's in Judea. He going, goes back to Galilee. But he has to go through Samaria. And the text doesn't explain that necessity. He had to go through Samaria. But actually when we read the text, we realize this was the reason he had to go through Samaria. So he is on his way. And... It is interesting, you see, when the text of the Bible mentions things like the town of Sikar, and then explains like, oh, there is, you know, the well of Jacob, and then he gave that land to his son Joseph, and so on. So these things are not mentioned just because the, the writer uh, uh, was like, well, uh, I need to say something, but I really don't know what to say. There are certain symbolism, historical re relevance, why things are mentioned. And obviously, later in the text, we read that this Samaritan woman mentions this. So there is a connection why John has, obviously, by inspiration from the Holy Spirit, write down this. So, uh, about this, from the book of Genesis, we can read chapters 33 of chapters 48, uh, about the, the wells and the giving of the land, uh, when Jacob gave this land to Joseph. And then it says that it was uh, six hours, it was 12 p.m. roughly, and, uh, well, Jesus was tired, and he sat down by the well. Well, that's nothing new in the world that they were living, and, uh, you know, Moses sat down by the well, and you know how the story developed there, <laughs> from there. So, uh, if, we, if the Bible was written in our time, probably would say they met at the gas station, I don't I don't know. <laughs> That's like where, where you kind of sit down to rest, get your coffee, fill in the tank, and continue on your journey. Um, but what is interesting about this relationship, why it is mentioned, you know, Joseph, Jacob's well. Remember Joseph? Remember his suffering? I mean, we even had a, a, a year or so ago, uh, the whole letter series about the Joseph and the narrative and well for most part he was suffering not justly there was a violence done to him <laughs> however as we go through the story of Joseph what is the punchline at the end but God meant it for good we meant it for evil the brothers meant it for evil 
but God meant it for good. Amen. So, and now we come to this Samaritan woman, and usually she is already labeled, she is the easy lady, but I would say, let us slow down, and let us give her a credit that maybe, I mean, the story doesn't tell us this, the story doesn't go into details, but it leaves a space for us to think that maybe she, the life that she has, is not necessarily the one she most likely chose for herself. Maybe even her life is she is suffering unjustly. That's a possibility. I'm not saying it's 100%. But let us leave it as we go on with the narrative. So... We are told that um, she was there, obviously, uh, to draw water. Now, probably she was no one to the town. Well, you know, it was not usual to have five husbands and then, you know, not even five, and then you live with a, another man and it's not your husband. Whatever the story, she was probably avoiding the social moments of... Here she comes, of, ah, poor woman, or, you know, you should, lessons, and all of that. And I think she was fed up for so many of those well-intended, and she just wanted to be there alone, not seeing anybody. And most likely the 12 o'clock would be a time when she wouldn't see anyone, and oh, there she meets Jesus. Okay, she sees he is a stranger, but interestingly enough, as we said, Jesus breaks two things in normal, quote-unquote normal, relationship, Samaritans and Jews. Samaritans and Jews, Judeans, don't talk to one another. You know, if Judeans had to go to Galilee, they would most likely completely bypass the Samaritan region, not even go walking through it, you know, because they didn't want to hang out with the Samaritans in any case. But Jesus is going through, and he is on a mission. He's not there by mistake. And then again, he's a rabbi, he's talking to a woman, and that's like, no, no, in those days. Well, he, he asks for obvious thing, like, look, <laughs> I'm thirsty, I'm tired, that's why I'm by the well, you know, like, get me some water. And she's like, well, you know, you're, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan, so like, why are you talking to me, like, what's going on here? And on top of it, you're a man and I'm a woman, so we shouldn't be talking in any case. But that's not... What Jesus is about. Jesus is about to tell her that she is worthy. He's about to tell her that her life matters to him. Much more than any social relationships. Well, obviously, he is teaching her that if she knew the gift of God and who he was, he would give her living water. Now, she's still not catching the idea, so she's like, well, first of all, like, you're talking to me about some water, you have nothing to take this water out from, and, like, the well is deep, so, you know, like, it takes some extra help here. And, and then she goes like, well, you know, um, I would love that, because... I'm coming every day to get this water. So how, how come I have this source of living water coming out like I don't have to get this water? And you know what is interesting? Well, yes, she's not catching it. Like she needs help to understand what's going on. But let, let me put this in the, in the context of the Jews or Judeans. Well, they didn't catch it either. You know, but... She said, are you greater than our father Jacob? Now, this is interesting. She is not without any knowledge of the tradition. 
So she's not just a woman. So that's, uh, I mean, um, not just a woman saying like, you know, like not caring about what's going on in life and uh, where are we and what is our tradition, what is our history. That's what I'm saying. When, so she's not just like completely oblivious to what is happening, what is the history of the people and so on. So she, she's knowledgeable of certain things. So she knows about, this is the well of Jacob. And she knows that that's the well that it was given to the posterity. And she's mentioning the herds and the sons and so on. So it has some value for her. And her question is genuine. Are you greater than our father Jacob? But you know, Nicodemus in chapter 3 also asked Jesus, are you greater? Uh, sorry, Jews in chapter 8 later will be mentioned to Nicodemus. Jews in chapter 8 said, are you greater than our father Abraham? You see, when you meet Jesus, there is something about him that leaves you puzzled. That, you know, we cannot really put him in a box. That's who we people are. We like to put things in a box. When they're in our box, then it's fine. If they're outside of our box, we are upset. And this woman, she's like, you know, you're greater than our father Jacob. Like, how, where do I put you? What do I do with you? But as the Jews, so the Samaritans, they need some tuning <coughs> and learning extra explanation who God is and what is his will. Now, he asks for a drink. Now, what is interesting, as a topic of the Gospel of John, he will continue with this topic of a drink, and then Jesus, what here he announced, he will confirm in chapter 7, quoting in chapter 7, he says, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. So there is this promise of what God has for us. For, for example, this earthquake, it's not necessarily the life they would choose for themselves. People in Ukraine who are suffering the war, it's not necessarily the life they would choose for themselves themselves. So maybe this woman lived the life that not necessarily she would have chosen for herself. So she recognizes that something there is about Jesus. You are a prophet, I see. In the same way as she didn't like it, she liked that that, she, that he had a prophetic insight. Now, I would say that for two reasons. You see, you're a prophet, says a Samaritan woman. You're a teacher, says Nicodemus in chapter 3. So the Jews and the Samaritans recognized Jesus, that there is something about him, but they needed extra explanation. And her question, again, or... A state, uh, question to, to the statement that he is a prophet is like, okay, where are we to worship? Like, well, look, she doesn't have a chance every day to talk to a Jew. There is no social media, so she can send an SMS or, you know, a quick message to someone in the south or north uh, and ask for a question. And even less, she can talk to a rabbi and recognize him that he's a prophet. So, as I said, she's knowledgeable of the tradition, and she really wants to know. She's not avoiding the fact that her life is a mess. That's usually what is talked about. Like, her life is a mess, and she wants to avoid her life. And they're like, no, no, no. She said the truth, I have no husband. Jesus confirmed that. She didn't lie. She wasn't hiding her life. She was honest. Look, I have no husband. You need in a bracket translation. I'm, my life is mess. So, she's asking, where are we to worship? Mount Gerizim is actually there where they are, you know. 
under the foot of the mountain, which is one of the mountains mentioned, or we are to worship in Jerusalem. What is the name of the mount? Mount Zion. But you know what is interesting? There is another mountain mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 11 that were given to the sons of Israel that their half of the tribes will be on the Mount of Ebal pronouncing curses if they are not faithful to the Lord and on Mount Gerizim pronouncing blessings. And they are on the Mount of Gerizim like, it's like here we are pronouncing blessings. So her question is almost like where are we to worship? Because worship is connected to a place of worship. And can you imagine that we, now after the teaching of Jesus and, and what we know in the Bible, that still today people have a need to go to a certain place of worship? But Jesus says the time is coming and it's already here that we will worship God in spirit and in truth. So we are here. We are just as worthy of worshipers as the ones who are right now on Mount Gerizim, Mount uh, Zion, on wherever in the world worshiping Jesus. Because the true worshipers are in spirit and in truth. And that's a very relieving thing because we do not have to make any pilgrimages to defend or to confirm our being we are worshippers. So it's not about a place, but it's a spiritual dimension. And when Jesus said, you Samaritans do not know, but we Jews do know, and the salvation comes from the Jews. Why? Because... For Samaritans, they receive only the first five books of Moses, or the Torah, or the law. Use the whatever title you, you like. Well, as you know, when we read our Bibles, we have the Torah, we have the prophetic writings, and then we have so-called writings, or even Psalms, so you will find this pro the law, the, the prophets, and the Psalms in the New Testament, for example. So, you have this the revelation of who God is that is given to the people of Israel. And therefore, Jesus stands on this as we know whom we follow. Plus, let us be reminded. Now, this is a little clarification help from the history. When back in the history, there was this northern and southern kingdom. So northern kingdom was called Samaria, southern kingdom was called Judea. The northern kingdom was taken by Syrians. The Syrians took them away and brought other people in their place. And suddenly there was a mix of worship. There were all kinds of gods there. When Babylonians came, they took the people from Judea or Jerusalem. They took some of them to uh, Babylon. But some of the people left. There was not so much mix of worship. Though there were other constant problems with the following other gods. You know, the Bible is clear about it. So there was even that distinction, you know, we, we don't have this syncretistic element, so to speak. And then Jesus says, God is spirit. And this is interesting because John, as in the gospel and in the first letter of John, we will, he will say God is spirit, God is love, and God is light. And in Hebrews it's written, God is consuming fire. But these are... Uh, the, those characteristic statements who God is in the New Testament. But what is so important about this worshiping is that Jesus taught that the worshippers must share something of the nature of the person worshipped. Now, even to the people of Israel, when they were about to make this temple and so on, remember the question of God like, uh, how can, you know, you think that this temple can contain me like I hold the whole world? I'm paraphrasing here, of course, but like I, I'm everywhere. I cannot just be in this little temple. You see, the, 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 the idea of the nations back then was my God is God of the territory where I live. 
So the gods of Egypt were in Egypt. They were not active outside of Egypt in the mindset of the people. Yet, God of Israelites was active as in the promised land. So he was active in Egypt. And therefore, all these, uh, uh, what's the name of those ten plays that happened, that it was actually, God was telling the Egyptians that he is ruling even Egypt and not their gods. So, where do I worship God? Everywhere. How do I worship God? In spirit and in truth. Because God is spirit. And now, ladies said, there is a Messiah to come. And Jesus says, I'm He. Wow. Now, when we read in the rest of the, you know, the text, like when He would deal with the Judeans, Jews, it would be like, and don't tell anyone. Now here, he goes, I am he. Like, what's, what's going on? Well, most likely because over there, in Judea, there was like always something like political, religious political, like who is who, who is taking my place, my territory. But here, there is nobody's territory to take. Jesus had no political or religious opposition so to speak, that he needs to fight with. And he's telling this woman, I am he. He revealed himself. He wasn't hiding his messiahship. Now let us go on to the text. So, just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say four more months and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the reaper draws his wages. Even now, he harvests the crop of eternal life for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We are no longer we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Now, disciples return and, and see this so unexpected picture. Jesus is talking to a woman, and a Samaritan woman. <laughs> you know, like, can you ask Jesus anything? Well, I think they tried in the meantime with other things and <laughs> they realized they were quickly shut up. So it's like, we better not ask anything because we're going to be shut up here. But with, the woman is going back to the town and she has a story to tell. And I like this. He told me everything. Well, how come from bring me your husband comes to everything? But you see... When, the, when you encounter God, and when you know that God knows that little particular thing, you know that He knows everything. How can you hide anything from God? So, she goes to the town and she, she's giving this, and she's asking, maybe He is the Christ, maybe He is Messiah. It's interesting, she's not even making a statement, he is. Even though Jesus told her, I am he. Well, 
Yeah. Well, let's check on that. <laughs> and then the, the, the disciples tell, tell Jesus, like, Rabbi, like, now, now we are alone, like, eat something. You know, like, we went to buy food and eat something. And isn't it interesting? Now, again, the topic of the Gospel of John, the food. One of the statements who Jesus sees, I am the bread of life. Another thing about the food, what we read here, is the same thing what we read in Matthew chapter 4. We even had a two Sundays ago a sermon on this, and obviously quoting from Deuteronomy. Not everything. Is it? So, my food is what? To do the Father's will. The Word of God is the food. So this food is much more than just bread that we see or what we feel. And yet, let us not be mistaken, Jesus was tired, so he did uh, sit down by the well. He <laughs> wanted to have a drink of water, but that water was much more important for the woman. And, and then they go into this harvesting We obviously know when, where, wherever we are, whether, you know, if we have something to harvest, we have to wait for a certain time. You don't harvest every day. In the middle of winter, no harvest, right? Well, imagine again, Jesus is talking about spiritual things. Harvest is when? Every time is the season. Every day is the season. Every time is a good time. And not only that, harvest. Where do you harvest? In the place when you don't really expect. For Jews, there was Samaria. You expect any harvest in Samaria? No way. Jews didn't even want to go through Samaria. They would avoid Samaria if they had to go to Galilee and vice versa. But where is the harvest? In the most unlikely place. So remember that? In Acts chapter 1, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. And what was the statement of the Samaritans? He is the savior of the world. So, not only her testimony, though her testimony is valid. Jesus elevated this woman, this woman who was probably... And again, for who knows what kind of reasons, lived the life she had and was of not the best social acceptance, yet Jesus made her worthy, worthy of witnessing about him. And the Samaritans believed. The suffering of the woman, remember the suffering of Joseph? Injustice suffering, but there was a blessing to the brothers and actually to the, to the Israelites. The suffering of the woman suddenly becomes the blessing to the Samaritans. Her testimony is true. And then not only that her testimony is true, they heard by themselves. He is the savior of the world. What is that place that we think it's Unlikely for a harvest. Well, whatever it is, what we think it is, let us repent and believe. The harvest is ready. And the encouraging thing about here is whose story is this? It's God's story. So you never know who has sown before you and I. And we come in and we think, like, we just said a word and they believe. Uh huh. Who knows how many times they've heard. Heard, they had the revelation, they had angelic visits, who knows what and how God was dealing with them. So we are just, as it's written in the Gospel of Luke, and what is servants, we did what we were supposed to do. That's it. Nothing to be taken for us, nothing to, like, look at me, no, nothing. I'm just obedient to what I believe God calls me to do. 
And the Samaritan woman, she is elevated to the status worthy. You are worthy. Jesus made her worthy. She is not just somewhere there in the social relationships, but she is worthy of her word and testimony. I know that throughout the history, the structures, the power structures, men left very unpleasant picture for most women and many times even this last week there was this march for on the uh, march on the march on, or uh, march on the march 8 uh, for ladies and uh, they were uh, one of the you know posts was saying may the church go away in a much harder words and you know what if you don't want to go to church you're free but if you come to church just as you say that the word of God or the message is insulting to you well let me tell you welcome to the club it is insulting to me do you think that I would like to live the way I want not as God wants ha! I want to but you know what I made a decision that what is written in the Word of God is much more important than what I want. And I decided that I would follow Him regardless how much I feel that I have right for this or I have right for that. Because He is worthy. He is the Savior of the world. And let me just quickly touch on this because this is a whole topic we can talk for hours. You know, in all this now later gender issues, just today I saw uh, on a Facebook one insert, there's this lady, she's uh, in a cat suit, and she goes, I'm a cat, I'm not a woman, I'm a cat. And I'm like, lady, you're welcome to be whatever you want. But the moment you come to God, and you say, but I want to be accepted as I am, no. We are all accepted as He says we are, created in His image. And He created us, men and women. Yes. Men, uh, man and woman. Men, women. So He created us in those ways. That's it. How we feel. We can feel however. When it comes to God, when it comes to Bible, when it comes to accept what God says, we have to come to terms with His Word. Amen. Or why would you come to church? Tell me, why would you come to church? Why do you expect that the church will sing your song? No! The church can only sing this song. God's song. And please, women, men, However you feel, whatever you feel about yourself, let us come to terms with what God says who we are. Because only in Him we will find peace. And only in Him we will accept ourselves. You know, ladies, usually you have more problems with how do I look than men. Um, even though if you know you're a woman and you accept yourself as a woman, you don't accept yourself because, well, I have to correct my nose, I have to correct my this, my that, or whatever. We all have to come to terms of who we are. We all have to accept ourselves. Men, we all have to accept ourselves. I don't like that I don't have hair. I have to accept myself. I wish that I wake up next morning and I have hair, you know. I wish... But I don't. I have to accept myself. <laughs> and that's a minor thing. And we are invited. And God brings us to this place when He says worthy. And we are worthy for Him because He died for us. And you know what? He didn't wait for us to become worthy. He made us worthy. He pronounced us worthy. 
So let us live that label by him. We are worthy. Amen. Amen. Amen.